Dr. Dune.
murder.
Hello. With Father Dart, you came here today to learn about the most extraordinary group of animals that have ever appeared on this planet. The dinosaurs. But today, in contrast to those magnificent beasts, the creature we will be examining is admittedly less impressive, even puny in stature, and less than two meters tall. It is a paleontologist. Normally, it is Lucy, but now, using the latest in streaming technology, we can see for ourselves. Shall we? Hello there, everybody. And welcome back to Paleontology. Feeding almost entirely on plants, it has no sharp claws or fearsome teeth. Being so preoccupied with the study of ancient life, a fossil scientist seems to exist only to dig up, examine, and discuss fossils. Although many of his current share and retrusive hours here has learned to communicate over bus distances, broadcasting his strange sounds far and wide. Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex. It is indeed true in human face bone, birds are done. His bizarre display is fascinating to watch. Creatures like this are quite rare, requiring very specific conditions to survive. Oh, Thanks for the hydrate. Welcome to Paleontology. Cool, right? So that it does not die out like the fossil organisms which it studies, we must work to protect this rare and curious creature from extinction. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is so good to have you here. Happy Wednesday, and happy World Frog Day. It's World Frog Day today. We're going to be talking about what that means. We're going to be talking about... about where frogs came from, how they've evolved, how they've diversified and spread out across the globe, and what makes them so special and so worthy of our protection nowadays. Because it's estimated that like a third of extant frog species are at risk of extinction. And then after that... We're going to be raiding into science streams for another special scientist 
chat. I'm going to be crossing over with Belint of Science Streams, and we are going to be talking about some papers just published. Uh, it's going to be a, a lovely crossover between genetics and systems biology and paleontology. So I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a fun stream. Uh, for anybody who might be new, allow me to, uh, to introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. That's me. I work on dinosaurs in particular. I don't know a whole lot about frogs, so I'm going to be learning some things today as well. But dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, um, what I talk about five days a week here on Twitch, usually five days a week. This week might be an exception. Dinosaurs are also what I dig up during the summers. So uh, if you were with us last summer, you might remember our fieldwork live streams. Uh, like here. So I'm gonna pour some water into our plaster basin here. Digging up dinosaurs and live on Twitch. I'll show you how we apply the paper towel separator to the bone itself. Really looking forward to uh, doing more of this this next summer. Going to be leaving at the end of May at the at the latest to uh, continue some of our excavations, including this site here. Uh, pretty excited about that. It's going to be good. This is a big limb bone of a duckbill dinosaur that you see right here that I'm getting ready to jacket their vod or something like that. And so I was kind of working through that whole process and but once you start mixing step by clock, step, it is like clock is ticking to work on how that works dinosaurs like this yeah yeah and who knows we could end up digging this thing up and then not having any diagnostic material from this animal um because if we don't necessarily probably get a skull will. from this critter and you know might not be responsible to give it a new name um we'll see well i don't know it depends it is going to be stratigraphically unique most likely. And so Anywho. the post yeah. all the bones behind the skull. Uh, that's me. That's what I do. Happy World Frog Day, everybody. Before we jump into, or should I say hop into World Frog Day, why don't we see who's here in the chat and say hello to everybody. And then uh, we can really get this thing kicked off. Um, we've got Claire Burr and we've got Smorphus... Cow Smorph. Sorry, you've got to do that. That's really lousy, Smorph. It's so tough to lose a pet. Um. Yeah. Well, shoot. I um. I I. I don't know what to say, Smorph. Goodness. Shoot. I'm so sorry, Smorph. That's really lousy. Uh, Majestic Biscuit, Rachel Darling Endeavors, hello, hello. Neilf, it's good to see you. Fall Machine, Golganek, Grim Deviant, Rosand. Rosand, I got a box in the mail from you today. It arrived. Um, I'll take that out in a minute. Don't let me forget. Um, we've got Salamander. We've got Trappy Jenkins. We've got Matt M33. Um, we've got the Mayor of Space, Tolkien Otaku, uh, Red Tree TV, hello, hello, uh, Cast a Dreamer, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, um, Nerthos, hello to you too, um, and yeah, Frog Day, Rousey, here, let's try and make this a little bit more upbeat. Rousey, good to have you here, are you enthused about frogs? It's good to see you. Uh, Tommy Platicus says, imagine missing a paleontologizing stream on World Frog Day. I'm glad you're not missing it, Tommy Platicus. Thank you for your comment, by the way, earlier on the YouTube short. I appreciate that. And thank you for the hydrate, uh, Quadrillator. Cheers. Uh, Salamander says, hey, neat, my job is going to let me ease back into full-time hours. With only 49 hours a week. Oh, holy cow, Salamander. Yeah, I was a... 
I used to work like 43 to 45 hours a week and still not get paid full time or get benefits at one of my old jobs. Consistently work overtime. And uh, they have like creative accounting ways to make it so that you don't actually get the stuff that comes with working a 40 hour week. Um, reminder, the most common kind of theft in the United States is wage theft. But you don't hear about that on the news. Um, anyway, Lenina, you're having internet issues today. Well, shoot, I hope, uh, I hope those resolve quickly, Lenina. I'm glad you're here, though. Hope things are good. Um, Harry says, I, for one, welcome our AI Attenborough overlords. <laughs> That wasn't AI, that was, uh, that was, I edited that together myself. That's, like, a real human touch there. Um, yeah. Uh, love the crossover streams? I'm glad, Neil. I'm glad. It's gonna be fun today. Yeah. Mayor Spaces, I do know that frogs have bones in them. They do, Mayor of Space. Usually their own bones, but sometimes other critters' bones also when they ingest vertebrates. Yeah. Swims with whales, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Frog Champ says Rylesy, yes indeed. Yeah. Oh yeah, and if anybody would like some quality frog emotes, uh IOS at twitch.tv slash IOS has got some of the best ones. So check her out. Uh feel free to open whatever suits. Don't feel obliged to open immediately. Well let me just show you that I got it, Rosanne. Something else arrived in the mail too. But yeah, look. Australia Post. The wingspan of this flying monster would have been about 15 and one half meters. You're not a monster, MMRI Looney Source. Smash, MMRI smash, MMRI thank you, thank smash. you for the 15 months of support. I really appreciate that, Looney Source. I really do. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Um, thank you kindly. Yeah. Uh, um. And thank you, Rosand. I'm really looking forward to opening that. I'll I'll give it a few days, I think. And we got to schedule out our uh, our Easter Bilby stuff. I'm gonna be collaborating with uh, with Creatrix Brit. Can we get a shout out for Brit too? If you like 3D printing, if you like Star Wars, if you like cosplay, if you like chill creative streams, check out Creatrix Brit. Um, yeah. Uh, and Jermaine G, how are you doing? Says, hey everyone, love frogs? Well, you're here in the right place today, Jermaine G. Welcome back. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And Giorno says, I didn't know that today was, it's not National Frog Day, it is World Frog Day today, Giorno. When I was a kid, I used to have a frog in my aquarium. Very nice. We're going to be talking all about frogs today. Yeah, good stuff. Um, good stuff. Yeah. Anywho. I caught up to the bottom of chat faster than I thought I would. Well, it's so good to have everybody here today. Bjornus says, frogs are so silly. They can be pretty silly, you know? Hmm. And I have video proof of a frog playing a video game and otherwise being silly. Check this out. Hmm. Hmm. Ah! <laughs> Good stuff. Um, frogs. They're wonderful amphibians. They have a fossil record that goes back at least in the early Triassic, but molecular evidence suggests that they may have actually arisen back in the Permian. Talk about that too. Yeah. Will 62 says, good for him. I know, right? Good for him. 
And good advice, Bear Space. Good advice as always. And Weird Adult says, how hard would a frog bite? They don't have teeth? You'd be surprised. There were frogs that probably used to eat dinosaurs. And we'll be talking about that today. In fact, let me show you a clip. We'll be talking about this frog today as well. This is from Prehistoric Planet. This baby Mashiachosaurus is after that crab, and then... Holy cow. Yeah. Beelzebufo, the devil toad. Yep. One of the largest frogs that has ever existed. Watch out, little baby Mashiachosaurus. Yeah. Won't need to feed again for a month. He'll be showing up later on in our stream, too. But the fossil history of frogs is... I'm not going to say it's prolific, because we don't have that many fossil frogs. Frogs don't have a lot of the skeletal elements that make other animals more common in the fossil record. They don't have ribs. They hardly have vertebrae. They, uh... There's not a lot going on to a frog skeleton. They're mostly legs and arms, phalanges and skull. I think all modern frogs have just... Is it seven or is it eight? How many vertebrae do modern frogs have? Uh, Anura is the scientific name for frogs. There we go. Yeah. Uh, a frog, Anura, is any member of a diverse and largely carnivorous group of short-bodied, tailless amphibians composing the order Anura. And they've got a lovely illustration here. All these beautiful frogs. Frogs also include toads. Toads are a kind of frog. I want to make that obvious right off the bat. Yeah. Um, Lordy says they're just kind of organ blobs. I mean, sort of, yeah. Being amphibious and relatively small, they don't necessarily need a whole lot of skeletal structure to keep them together. In fact, the whole metamorphosis thing might actually have something to do with their lack of skeleton. I would not be shocked if that were the case. I've not read this anywhere. I'm just kind of reasoning through this. But, um, yeah, they are, uh, they are pretty cool critters. They are pretty cool critters. Um, let's see here. Where did it talk about? Yeah, the oldest proto-frog, Triadobactricus. So known from the early Triassic. Maximum darnage. Thank you, thank you for the 21 months of support. I really appreciate that. Maximum darnage. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for keeping me online for the past 21 months. Appreciate you. Yeah. Royalty says, so all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Exactly. Yes. Toad and frog are not equivalent terms, but because toads are kind of fossils, frogs. Especially dinosaurs. We capture the imagination of children, and that makes vertebrate paleontology a gateway for all science. It's true. Hyacinth Live. Children are walking through that gateway right now. Howdy, howdy, and welcome to Paleontologizing, Hyacinth. It is wonderful to have you here. How did your stream go? Thank you for that very froggy raid there. It is good to have you here. Holy cow. Hyacinth. How did it go? It looks like you were doing some science and technology also. Beautiful. Um... We came here to find fossils. And four button soul, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Kiss Army 36, Ox Aria, Hyacinth Live, Safin. How are you all doing? Kind of funny. I mean, you know. <laughs> they are kind of the funny. The paleontologist field isn't narrow to what we understand. On the contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. The Rocket Jumper and Brick Muppet. Great names. Thank you. Thank you for the follows. I appreciate those very much. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Shoot. 
My name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as Hyacinth probably told you. And paleontology is what I do. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I dig up, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and usually what I talk about five days a week here on Twitch. This week is an exception, because I'm not streaming on Friday. And also, we're talking about frogs today. It's World Frog Day today. And so if you like frogs, you're in the right place. And if you don't like frogs, you're also in the right place, because I bet you by the end of this stream, you'll have a newfound appreciation for our froggy buddies. The Anura frogs. Uh, but it seems like we've got some new folks here. Uh, like you, Brick Muppet. Hello, hello to you. I dig those froggy emotes. Beautiful. Um, if, like Brick Muppet, you are new here, maybe you came in with the raid from Hyacinth Live, give me a one in the chat if you'd like to see a welcome, a welcome video. If you'd like a short little explainer about who I am, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch, all that good stuff. Give me a one in the chat if you'd like to see a quick welcome video. Just for you. Four Button Soul has given us a one. Excellent. Okay, okay. Let's get a few more. Brick Muppet's given us a one. Okay. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to call forth a good friend of ours whom we called Previously Recorded Danny. This will be a different video from the one we watched yesterday. And uh, previously recorded, Danny's going to tell you a little bit about who I am, what a paleontologist is doing here on Twitch in the first place, all that good stuff. So, uh, can we get one more shout out for Hyacinth Live there? Thank you again for your raid. I really appreciate it. I will leave you briefly in the very capable hands of previously recorded, Danny. Previously recorded, Danny. Take it away. Thanks, present day, Danny. You know, people ask me all the time. Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary, and Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada, but most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana, in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. 
all these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on Spinosaurus. Alright, but don't ask me too much about that because it's uh, still a project in the works and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the west coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. But finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see a rare and ancient thing, like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And Historic horrors. What's all this archaic anatomy in aid of? Q Circuit One, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. And thank you, Hyacinth Live, once again for that beautiful raid. I really appreciate it, Hyacinth. Um, good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Johnny Autonomous says, cool story. Thanks, Johnny Autonomous. Cool story, bro. <laughs> appreciate you, Johnny Autonomous. And Cyan Streams, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I'm Let's looking forward to our... If they're removed, America loses them forever. And holy cow, Brick Muppet, thank you, thank you for subscribing. Holy moly, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for that. That is exquisite, and I am deeply grateful for your support, Brick Muppet. Thank you for supporting science, science here on Twitch. Enjoy those emotes. Emotes like these, and 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 these. The cool thing about dinosaur emotes is you can spam them just about anywhere on Twitch, and uh, people don't get mad. Instead, they ask you, where did you get those dinosaur emotes? Where can I get some dinosaur emotes? Everybody loves dinosaur emotes. Everybody likes dinosaur emotes. Oh, yeah. 
Frank Big Time says, can confirm. Everyone loves dinosaur emotes. It's true. It's if you're true. feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Quest thank you, Hogan. Thank you, thank you for those hundred bits, Hogan. Thank you kindly. We're close to a hype train here. Yeah. Science Stream says, it's true. I've had friends who have come and subscribed here without even you seeing the channel. The most dangerous dinosaur around. And thank you, Haraz, for those 33 months. I appreciate that very much, Haraz. Thank you, thank you. Um, Science Dreams, thank you for the confirmation. I'm looking forward to our crossover very much in a little bit. I've got my own Psycad here on the desk as a uh, kind of a visual aid, because we're going to be talking about Psycads on our crossover. We're going to be, it's going to be a plant heavy crossover. I'm excited about that. But right now we're going to be talking frogs is there a video which exists for world frog day um let's try this Oh, this is the YouTube free music. This is a banger. Poison dart frogs feed mostly on small insects. Which is you know, I'm more looking for like a one of those goofy news broadcast videos where they send a reporter out to look at some frogs to talk about World Frog Day. Maybe we look for stuff that's been updated, uploaded more recently. Um, it's all shorts. Um, and, uh, scam stuff, like this Bitcoin nonsense. Um, so many shorts. The shorts are taking over YouTube. Holy cow. Um. And let's try this. World Frog Day 2024. It's World Frog Day. Uh... Frogs are very, very cool animals. Their individual life histories are really, really fascinating. Looking at how frogs develop. The whole metamorphosis that they undergo is totally fascinating. Huge ontogenetic change. And this organization here, Ozzy Ark. A long time ago. There Thank you, Helga. Lizards, don't you know? Uh, <laughs> ontogeny. Fun fact: Poison dart frogs don't make their own poison; they get it from the food they eat. Sort of, yeah. They they kind of bioaccumulate it, but their bodies also do change it a bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons why other animals that eat the same food don't develop this this crazy poison um but yeah yeah we're gonna be learning a, a bit about poison dart frogs later i think hogan but yeah thank you for the 1000 bits holy cow hogan thank you thank you for that holy moly that is excellent holy cow hogan uh, Failing says, when YouTube was young, videos were aimed to be one hour long. Then due to the monetization re reasons, 10 minutes was the optimum. Now it's 60 seconds, soon it'll be 10 seconds, then one, then less than one second, then the universe explodes, and the cycle will restart. I am now part of the problem here. Um, because look, I've started uploading YouTube shorts. And they are getting too many views. That's Check why it. birds are dinosaurs. In order to be a dinosaur, you have to have evolved from this earliest dinosaur ancestor. That is, by definition, what constitutes a dinosaur. If you didn't evolve from the earliest dinosaur ancestor here, the earliest ancestor of all the rest of the dinosaurs that is a dinosaur, uh. we call the most basal dinosaur, then you're not a dinosaur. That's why birds... Anyway. Um, and we've already got comments on it. Uh, oh, from Tommy Plotticus. Who's that? Well, well, well. 
I'm Vladikus says, birds are dinosaurs. Important stuff everyone should learn. Always good to understand your surroundings. Agreed. Yeah. And Claire Burr says, this really? Yeah. Um, this person says, the earth is fat. And look, we've got replies. Yeah. I said, you're correct. The earth is fat. Approximately 12,756 kilometers fat at the equator, in fact. I think this person tried and failed to type out the phrase, the earth is flat. And you know, as they say in the South, you know, just, oh man, bless their heart, you know, just, just, just bless their heart. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, and Claire says, paleo, lol, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. This is the thing, anytime you start talking about dinosaurs on the internet in a, a place where, like, the algorithm features really heavily, you get a bunch of just jokers and miscreants who come in and, and try and raise trouble and, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah. Um... Anyway, and Harry Vetch, oh, that's, oh, I've, I'm being even more uh, forceful for, than that in my bless your heart there, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm now in the YouTube shorts game also. Oh, boy. But if it helps with outreach, it helps with outreach, you know? It's already got 16 likes. And 305 views. That's nuts. I just uploaded this like an hour ago or something. And 305 people have watched it? Or maybe one person has watched it 304 times? And then I've watched it once? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Uh, how's the Tink Tonk doing? It's already got 347 views? That is ridiculous. Why? That's why birds... Yeah. Dinosaurs. In order to be a dinosaur... You have and to Claire Burr, you were correct. This earth yeah. Is a dinosaur ancestor. That is, by definition, what constitutes a dinosaur. If you didn't evolve from the earliest dinosaur ancestor here, the earliest ancestor of all the rest of the dinosaurs that is a dinosaur, Called the most basal dinosaur, and you're not a dinosaur. That's why birds like um. In order to be a dinosaur, Postosuchus. have to evolve from this earliest dinosaur ancestor. That is, by definition, what constitutes a dinosaur. If you didn't evolve from the earliest dinosaur ancestor here, the earliest ancestor of all the rest of the dinosaurs that is a dinosaur. Yeah. Basal dinosaur. Then you're not a dinosaur. That's why birds... Anyway, they're making it ridiculously easy to uh, to upload YouTube shorts and TikToks and stuff like that from Twitch. It's, um, it's almost kind of dangerous how easy they make it. It requires so little thought. Um, it's almost frictionless. You just go to your, uh, your clips here. And then, let's see, here. Mark my words, 2024 will be the year that my Spinosaur paper finally gets published. Mark my words, chat. Mark my words. 2024, that Spinosaur paper's getting published. Somebody clip this right now. 2024 is when the Spinosaur paper will be published. So, what you do right here... Mark my words, 2024 will be the year that my Spinosaur paper finally gets published. Is it? It's super, super Mark easy my to... Mark words, chat. Mark my words. 2024... They put it into portrait mode like this, and it just... Now. 
it's so it's so easy to do. It's ridiculous. Um, so you'll be seeing more of these. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Mark Den clipped. Yeah, there you go, Reagan Nation. Was that you, Reagan Nation? Who clipped that? Who clipped that? Uh, anyway, I'll be doing more of those. No, it was Lenina who clipped it. Good on you, Lenina. Yeah. Uh, um, well done. Yeah. Uh, now, wait, before we get back into World Frog Day, I've got something else to talk about here. I've got a package which just arrived right before I started streaming. I had OBS all set up, I was working on the angle, working on setting up my office here, and then, and then Lordy walks in with a package. Um, holy cow, we were just talking about this yesterday. I didn't know that something could arrive this quickly. But we were talking about, um, plastic models, we were talking about Spinosaurids, I showed off the PNSO Sukumimus. And, um... Yeah! Holy cow. Look at that right there. Look at that. There was no note inside. I do not know who sent this. No... No note. I don't know who to thank. But... Sweetie Pie, did you see this? We've got a Sukumimus in here. Since I work on Spinosaurids, um, I, I am very, very grateful for this. Holy cow, this is probably the most beautiful Sukumimus sculpt I've seen anywhere. And um, now we have it here. Let's open it up. Oh, this is like the gold standard for plastic dinosaur models. It really doesn't get much better than this. It's, uh... Trace says those knives are illegal here in the UK. A pocket knives are illegal, Trace? It's just a pocket knife. A flick knife. It flips open? I mean, it... Only if you make it flip open. I mean, it just... I don't know. It's a utility knife. It's not spring-loaded. No. Brit's right. Yeah. Need a license for that knife? Says Gene Wen. <laughs> it's not a switchblade. No, a switchblade, you press a button and it goes... Of its own accord. This is not like that. This you got to use your wrist to flick. Yeah. Um, a knife longer than three inches as locking mechanism. Yeah, that, I don't think that's this, Rosan. It's got a shorter blade than that. Yeah, no worries. Anyway, let's open this up. I wonder if this would also be illegal in the UK. You've got similar dinosaurs, such as Baryonyx, which certain paleontologists have actually suggested is the same genus as Supermimus. They might have a point, but, uh... Let's open her up. <laughs> oh, boy! Look at that. Oh my goodness. Oh, that is exquisite. Holy cow. You look at that. With an articulating lower jaw. 
single image. Look how thin that jaw is from side to side. This is really, really cool. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I am deeply grateful if... Would anybody like to come forward and, and say that they were the one who sent this? Because this is exquisite and you don't, you don't have to say that it was you, but I am delighted and surprised and when I put this on the wish list just on a whim, I did not expect anybody to to spring for it like that. And Lunisaurus, this is indeed a fish-eating dinosaur, yeah. We'll be talking much more about these animals, about Baryonyx, about Sukumimus, about... this is Sukumimus here. About Spinosaurus and Irritator and Ichthyovenator, we'll be talking about all those critters. Once my paper gets closer to publication, when I have that submitted. Oh man, I'm excited. Very excited. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Reagan Nation, for gifting Logan. I appreciate it. Yeah. And it comes with this wonderful little book right here, too. Yeah. Prehistoric animal models that accompany your growth. AKA your ontogeny. Yeah. And Thabo, it's just an interesting name, the Sukumimus. If that is a common first name in Niger, then that would make sense, because this animal is from Niger. Sukumimus. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. This is really neat. Um, I had no dorsal sails on my back. Well, I mean, I'm not convinced Spinosaurus did either. You didn't hear that. But, yeah. Uh, it's a male and female African given name. For Lithop. Interesting. Okay. It's a Soto, Setswana, and Sepedi. Interesting. But not from Niger, right? So, Sukumimus is from Niger. And, um, yeah, this is lovely. A little book like this, really, really neat. And then you can learn how to draw the animal, too. This is so cool. This is really cool. What a wonderful educational resource. If you've got, like, a dinosaur-obsessed kid in your life, and you want to get them a, a really sophisticated high quality gift pnso does some beautiful beautiful stuff find out what their favorite dinosaur is and see if pnso makes a model of it because oh man I, this is not sponsored content this is not an advertisement but man if if a chunk of plastic like this can make a paleontologist this happy Imagine what it would do for a dinosaur-obsessed kid, you know? This is, this is beautiful, and I, I love it. I, and it, it's so high quality that it, it literally stands up of its own accord. Look, look. Look at that. It stands up on its own. Those forelimbs are not contacting the ground. Look, there's there's daylight underneath. Not contacting the ground. Uh, how cool is that? It is that well engineered, that high quality, that they've actually managed to get a bipedal dinosaur to stand up on its own without its forelimbs contacting the ground, and without its tail contacting the ground. That is a mark of quality in a plastic dinosaur model. Yeah. A trace is heavily weighted in the rump? Well, I mean, that's what the, that's literally what the tail is for. 
It's a it's a counterbalance. Like that's what the tail evolved for. So that these animals could could walk on two legs without being unbalanced. The tail is at one time a well at the same time it is both an attachment point for the thigh muscles and it's a counterbalance for the rest of the body. Spinosaurids seem to have had pretty long tails like this as a way to counterbalance the body. I think the elongate dorsal spines might also have something to do with that, too. But yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So did whoever sent this... Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate your generosity. Let's get some applause for our mystery donor here. Fantastic. Appreciate you. And now my uh, my Megalosaurus has some company. These are both Megalosauroids, by the way. Spinosaurs and Megalosaurs are, uh, are sister groups. It's thought that they both evolved from the same ancestor, which is super cool. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um... With that said, Red Bull says, can you link the company again? Well, here, let me just show you. Um, just to the side. ENSO is the, uh, the company name. Whether it's Amargosaurus, this looks like Giganotosaurus. Their Stegosaurus is gorgeous. Um, they've got a lovely Acrocanthosaurus. I think Lenina, you might have this one? Or do you have the Schleich one? Or, or Papo, maybe. But yeah. There's their U Tyrannus. Oh boy, that's beautiful. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, you don't have the PNSM one yet. Oh, Lenina, you should put together a wish list and uh, link to that on your stream. <laughs> But yeah, and the Borealis Pelta. Yeah, the Borealis Pelta is amazing, Baja Spencer. I have the Borealis Pelta too somewhere. It's still in a box. I haven't unpacked it yet since uh, since moving. But yeah, Truckhorn bought that for me. Yeah, and it's on your wish list. Very nice, Lenina. Very nice. Yeah. Anyway, uh, to our mysterious anonymous donor, I appreciate you. I appreciate you very much. Uh, Welcome to Utah. Um, and as we get into World Frog Day, um, let's see. Man, these are really all just shorts, aren't they? On YouTube. Yeah, so. Hey, let's try this. San Antonio, oh, Texas. Hey, before we go, you gotta check this out. We're hopping into the spring today is World Frog Day. Yes, yeah. It's about providing frogs with safer environments. Animal experts say frogs have been around for roughly 256 million years. And I, oh, I love that. I love that. Kudos to you, KENS5, your San Antonio news source. Breaking up the origin and fossil history of frogs here. Uh, frogs have been around for roughly 256 million years. I don't know if it's quite that long. The, the origin of frogs is still a little bit mysterious. We know they go at, like, at least back to the early Triassic. So like at least like 245 million years ago. 256... I think molecular studies have suggested that, but anyway, the fossil record, the earliest frog that we have is like Triatobactricus, I think, from the early Triassic. But yeah, anyway, this is uh, this is good stuff. I'm so glad they put that here. 
Frog Day. Yeah, it's a day to raise awareness about providing frogs with safer environments. Animal experts say frogs have been around for roughly 256 million years. The Sanitary yeah. Zoo is taking visitors on an amphibian adventure with animal mm. chats, activities, and more at their World Frog Day celebration. That's it's squashed in completely the flat. The bone wall is so thin, it's about thin. the same dimension as the wall of a dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt, dirt, dirt. Well, that's what this thing is like. Cape Cod Shark, nine yeah. months of support, Cape Cod Shark. I love your a username, dirter. by the way. There's a lot of cool sharks that appear off the coast of Cape Cod. Uh, thank you for keeping me online for the past nine months. Appreciate your support there. That rhyme. Dirter. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. It's a visit mission button. today and free for members. So take advantage of it. Kids love to learn about frogs. For sure. Look at those eyes, though. And popping all sorts out. Of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inane newscaster banter. Oh. <laughs> But good on them, you know? Tradoon. Cool stuff. Frogs are intensely interesting animals. And somebody in the chat was asking who decides that it's World Frog Day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Tradoon. No, it's not Troodon doesn't decide that. Oh, Murph, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Cape Cod Shark says, always love your streams. Great info. Thanks, Cape Cod Shark. And happy World Frog Day to you. Yeah. Worldfrogday.org. It might be these people who might have something to do with it. March 20th. Every year, World Frog Day is a day dedicated to raising awareness for frogs and other amphibians. Frog populations have been under threat and many species are disappearing or have already gone extinct. Um, and then we have Save the Frogs Day, April 28th every year. I might be busy for that. But, yeah. Um, how long is this video? That's an hour. Okay. We might not watch that. In fact, it looks like we won't. But. Here's a link to worldfrogday.org. Yeah, April 28th is a Sunday? Yeah, I'm not going to be streaming that then. But, about. Yeah. The earliest mention of World Frog Day online is from 2012. For over a decade, World Frog Day lacked a website and had no organizing committee. The day was not much more than people sharing images of frogs online and saying, Happy World Frog Day. Given the popularity of the day and the decade and a half of ex experience that Save the Frogs is organizing Save the Frogs Day, the world's largest day of amphibian education and conservation, uh, which we conceived in 2009, we decided to build the World Frog Day website as a central source of information about World Frog Day. We welcome input from any amphibian enthusiasts. Very nice. Um, Lunisaurus says, when is World Stegosaurus Day? I don't think there is a World Stegosaurus Day, but... Hang on. We can find out when Stegosaurus was first described by O.C. Marsh, I betcha. Most of those Marsh dinosaurs have a specific date associated with them. Because uh, in his zeal to compete with, uh, with Edward Drinker Cope, they made sure to always post the dates of their publications. There we go. on those papers. Stegosauria. Stegosaurus armatus. Is this the right one? Um, da -da -da -da. Yep. 1877. And so this would have been published On November 15th, 1877. So November 15th is the birthday of Stegosaurus. Or the description day of this animal. Here is that original paper. It is really short. 
like these often tend to be. These papers from the Bone Wars. Um, yeah, I think this is it here. Yep. New Order of Extinct Reptilia Stegosauria from the Jurassic of the Rocky Mountains by Professor Othniel Charles Marsh. This was the original paper. He may have even sent it via telegraph. Just incredibly short. But yeah, November 15th, 1877. November 15th. Stegosaurus Day. Leninus is off to tell my eldest he shares a birthday with Stegosaurus. That is super cool, Lenina. Lucky him. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, and here is the publication right here. Whatever. Yeah. Um, in Diagonal says many frogs sing. Well, what is this, Diagonal? You're always providing us good stuff. Let's see. Yeah, here, I'll have to... I'll have to reverse this, and it, the audio will not show up in the YouTube video afterward. YouTube... National Geographic, I think, since they got, by, got bought by Disney, they're very litigious about this kind of thing. So, you can enjoy the audio here right now live, everyone, but uh, this will not show up in the VOD. Uh... There you go, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clever, yes. The, the bromeliad tree frog. The slate-colored solitaire. That's a bird right there. Highland guan. Howler monkey. Sounds of survival. Ah. I'd more recommend PNSO. Here you go, yeah. The exquisite spiked thumbed frog. And look at those beautiful tree ferns they've got going on there. Oh, man. Back here, too. Ah, gorgeous. That's kind of wild, right? That there is a frog species that exists in our world today that is known to herpetologists. Hazanku, 24 months, or 25 months, or 25 years by yours. Something like, it's somewhere in between there, Hazanku. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support, for keeping me online for that long. I really appreciate you. Zonku, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is wild that there is... There are still species of frog that have never been heard by scientists. They've never had their sounds recorded. We're not talking about fossil organisms here. We're talking about critters alive and hopping around today. In the year 2024. Never been heard. Uh, Rusty guy says, I thought it for sure would be Michigan J Frog. <laughs> Hello, my baby. Yeah. Um... <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, not quite. But you don't know until you record it, right? Yeah. I go harass. Then you go Stavros, yeah. Like Kermit the Frog sang. <laughs> Said, well played. <laughs> there you go, Red Bull Ring. Whoa. It's, it's down in the water. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. This is the mossy red eyed tree frog and the Kusuko Spike Thumb Frog. Hey, TMK, welcome, welcome. So they're testing that hypothesis that they vocalize underwater. We were with Ben, hang on, that said suddenly Ben heard it, the sound. Then I shone my light, and the exquisita was there. From in the water, it began below in the water, and it climbed until it reached the top. <laughs> wow. This is this is so cool. Cheeky Frog, I know, right, Diagonal? Thanks for sharing this. Wild. Salamander. Very 
very cool. Yep. This this is a point that Jack Horner makes all the time, is that if you're only reading what others have done, if you're only reading in books or in journal articles, your understanding is going to be incomplete. You know, you've got to actually get out there into the field and do original work to gain perspective that you can't possibly get from just reading the literature. If you want to actually make headway, make really impressive new discoveries in science, you got to get out there into the real world uh, or into the laboratory, you know? Yeah. The Exquisita and the Despuris are endemic to Kusuko National Park. It would be good if they didn't don't decrease or disappear. It's a beautiful thing to have a good relationship with nature and to know that every day we can learn something from diverse groups of animals. That's beautiful. I like that a lot. There's that link right there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Diagonal, for, for sharing that. Yeah. I'm just see a parody about Exquisita. Um, there's the, I just learned about this frog from this video. I don't feel qualified to write a parody song about it. Yeah. And Rebel Decibel says, but that being said, you should have at least some understanding. Oh, of course, yeah. Read everything that you can about whatever it is that you're that you're interested in. But take everything with a grain of salt and be ready to go out there and make your own discoveries. Cape Cod Shark, thank you for the 234 bits right there. I appreciate that very much, Cape Cod Shark. Thank you, thank you. Um Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And Amelia Bedelia, thank you. Appreciate the kind words. Well, where did frogs come from in the first place, though? What is the origin of frogs? There's this series that, that uh, paleontologist Benjamin Berger has on YouTube. Let's take a look at that. We might skip through it a bit. But let's see what he has to say about the origin of anurans, the origin of frogs. State and University's vertebrate paleontology course. Yeah. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this lecture, we will discuss the origin and evolution of frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians, the list amphibia, nice. the modern amphibians during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. And Baja Spencer, do you have a link to that video? That sounds cool. a monophyletic clade that includes modern amphibians. There we go. Yeah. As well as... And Sundown. Prehistoric horrors. What's all this archaic anatomy in Adolf? Thank you, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. There's one uh... extinct group called the Albane Areptodonte. Modern amphibians are split into three major groups. The Gymnophona, which includes yep. the, the legless Sicilians. amphibians called Sicilians, which live underground in tropical regions of the world. I have a song about them, the actually. Anura, the frogs. Yeah, Anura and means Uriella, tailless. Including the salamanders, yeah. which are sometimes called the caldata, since they have adult tails. Now, yeah. early That's the term that I'm familiar arose with, actually, from the aquatic out. environment during the yeah. late Paleozoic, and they split into two major groups based in part on the formation of the centrum in the vertebrae, the temnospondylins and the leptospondylins. Yeah. So the temnospondylins are things like Coolisuchus, which he'll probably now, talk about. Both of these groups were very successful during the late Paleozoic era even yeah. into the Permian period. Now, at the Permian-Triassic boundary, there right was a here. major oh. extinction event, one of the worst yeah. ever, and many of these early groups vanished. The Temnos bundles were reduced to two groups, the Trimatosauria and the Captiosauria. And, and yep, Trimatosauria and... Capitosauria, interesting. I'm not really familiar with these clades here. 
Tom Nespanels, you're you're you might be familiar with um with Kulasukas from the Walking with Dinosaurs series. We've talked about it briefly before, but uh here, take a look Later. at this right here. So this is a giant, almost salamander-like amphibian that lived in the early Cretaceous of Australia. Oh boy. It's about 500 kilos. It's about a thousand pounds. Kiddo called it a cockroach whale when he was five. That's really funny, Lenina. I mean, I, I could see it. I could see it. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Neat critters. So that is a good example of a Temnospondyl. Member of this clade and up here. And the leptospondylins were reduced to the amiota, which arose during the late Paleozoic, and of which includes and there you go, yes. reptiles, yes. birds, and mammals. Modern list amphibians appear for the first time near the Permian-Triassic boundary, with some of the earliest frogs and salamanders yeah, dated and to this time right in Earth's there. history. Now, the origin of list amphibians is often placed within the temnospondylins. This is because of similarities in the skull with the earlier fossil temnospondylins. Yeah, as mentioned yeah. previously, Anyway, we're gonna skip around here. Let's jump to of here. We go. Amphibians. To Where and when did they evolve? Place the origin of various groups within geographic regions. Frogs, for example, seem to have diversified after the breakup of the continents, particularly during the Cenozoic, hmm. while likely originating in the southern Gondwana. While that makes sense. salamanders arose in the north in Laurasia and Sicilians in the early sense. Atlantic Rift region. So this makes a ton of sense because I know that we've got frogs from the Cretaceous period from, say, Madagascar. Um, and then I have found the the bones, usually like the Atlas Axis vertebrae of, of salamander-like amphibians up in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, which are part of North America, part of Laurasia up here, um, you know, up in Montana. So that makes a lot of sense to me, that salamanders and their relatives first evolved up here, and the true frogs first evolved down here, and then later on, they would kind of spread throughout the world. Um, but yeah, yeah. Cool stuff. Um, I'll give you a link to this video. Here we go. We can see the formation of the Eurostyle with the yeah. long ilium blades, yet the sacral vertebrae are not completely fused. This... Anyway, frogs, cool critters. And yeah, frogs have less than nine vertebrae, as low as four. Yeah, they're, uh... As a result, finding material from frogs in the fossil record is tricky, unless you find, like, a skeleton. Like, being able to identify, like, oh yeah, this tiny little scrap of bone came from a frog is really difficult. Vertebrae are often what we use for a lot of critters like this. So we use for snakes, or salamanders, or etc. For frogs, you've not got very, very many vertebrae at all, so uh, not a very high likelihood that you'll find anything. You know?
Yeah, and I'll see you later, Hogan. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Now let's... Let's take a look at some fossil frogs, and let's take a gander at the biggest frog that ever lived. Many of you already know its name. We've got a lovely PBS Eons video about this. Let's take a 70 look. million years ago, and you are in northwestern Madagascar. The climate is subtropical and very seasonal, with long periods of drought broken up by stretches of heavy rain. Rivers dry up, leaving only ephemeral pools behind. It's a hard place to live for you and even your average amphibian. But this place is home to one hell of a weird frog. Paleontologists call it Beelzebufo, the so-called devil frog. And it may yeah. have been the largest frog that ever lived. Beelzebufo thrived in this environment, possibly because of adaptations that it had in common with some modern frogs that still live in these kinds of habitats. For one thing, its proportions were just weird, because it had a disproportionately big head and a really wide mouth. And it oh, probably yeah. had an incredibly powerful bite, making it a serious predator for smaller animals. It also had these flanges of bone on the back corners of its skull that were so big that they may have overlapped with its shoulder blades and even affected the movement of its arms. Now, the thing is, there are frogs around today that look a lot like this, with big bumpy skulls and huge mouths. And do you want to know what they're called? Because it's really awesome. When scientists are trying to be all serious about them, <laughs> they refer to these modern frogs as ceratophryids. But they're more commonly known as, wait for it, Pac-Man frogs. And yep. phylogenetic studies group Beelzebufo with modern Pac-Man frogs. But here's the problem. Hmm. So let's take a look at some Pac-Man frogs real quick. So that you've got an idea of what these critters look like. When they're trying to make a nice short video for the algorithm there, PBS Eons can't really show you all these clips and stuff. I can do that though, live on Twitch. They are neat critters. Holy cow. Take a look. There are currently eight accepted species of Pac-Man frogs, and they all hail from South America. The different species are all found, usually in non-overlapping ranges, in different parts yeah. of South America, which contributes to their other common name, South American horned frogs. <laughs> Mayor Space says Pac-Man frogs eat ghosts, just like their namesake. Yeah. Or sometimes cherries, too. The horns in these frogs are usually found above their eyes, and, along with their natural camo coloration, <laughs> the horns may aid in camouflage against predators, such I'm as mammals, reptiles, and... I'm interested in your island, it's got nothing to do with oil. I'm a paleontologist. Oh, okay. Burning Clay, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontology Island. Good to have you here. Yeah. Birds of prey. Pac-Man frogs basically look like a head with legs, and the common name Pac-Man comes not only from its very large and full of tooth-like projections grin, but also <laughs> from its voracious appetite, much like the video game character whose only purpose in life is to run away from ghosts and eat dots as well as the occasional fruit. Pac-Man frogs are considered sit-and-wait predators. They'll burrow into the soil, leaving only their heads exposed. They've even been observed wiggling their toes to attract the attention of prey, Pac-Man frogs will eat pretty much anything that they can fit in their mouth. Their sticky tongues are perfectly designed for ensuring anything they want to eat ends up in their stomachs. A Pac-Man frog's tongue- Soppy Salamander says, that's how I live my life? Really? You burrow down in the ground, just your mouth protruding, and then you eat whatever walks by? Oh, you run away from ghosts, eat dots, and sometimes eat fruit. That's, that also sounds a lot like Scooby-Doo. Except maybe substitute Scooby Snacks for dots. And also big sandwiches. Um, that, was, that was a trope on Scooby-Doo, wasn't it? But they're always eating large sandwiches. Yeah. Right? It reminds me of a certain uh, learned man. Yeah. Yeah. Company picnic.
Yeah, anyway. Um, you know who else could eat a big sandwich? Is, uh, well, you know what Pac-Man frogs are now. Let's get back to our fossil frog, Baelzebufa, which may or may not be a Pac-Man frog. It seems to be related to them at any rate. Skulls and huge mouths. And do you want to know what they're called? They're your rusty guy. really yeah. awesome. When scientists are trying to be all serious uh, about them, they refer to these modern frogs as ceratophryids. But they're more commonly known as, wait for it, Pac-Man frogs. Harry, In phylogenetic yeah. studies, group Beelzebufo with modern Pac-Man frogs. But here's the problem. Pac-Man frogs only live in South America, and Beelzebufo is only known from Madagascar, around 7 million diagonal. years ago. Huh. And Madagascar and South America haven't been connected for like 115 million years. So if these frogs are related, paleontologists have to explain how they ended up in totally separate places and figure out where and when their ancestors lived. And hmm. if it turns out that they aren't related, then why do they look so similar? Untangling the origins of Beelzebufo, the giant frog that lived alongside the dinosaurs, turns out to be one of the most bedeviling problems in the history of amphibians. Ah. And now, before we continue with this, a clip of Beelzebufo. Um, engaging with some dinosaurs here. Actually, here, hang on. I think... Um, show you this first. Here we go. Is a monster. Beelzebufo. Uh... <laughs> the devil toad. <laughs> so big, it can swallow a small dinosaur whole. Very small dinosaur. Or a very this large mammal. He isn't here to hunt. He is looking for a mate. Female devil toads are fussy. So he needs to find a good spot. Oh, will he be and Beards, we'll do that in a minute. Thank you. I forgot. Their timing couldn't be much worse. Yeah, so back to here. Before these critters arrive, let's do some Metazoo before I forget. And then you'll see what's sneaking up on our bales of Buvo here. It's time for Metazoo, our daily animal guessing game here. We've got 53 minutes to try and figure out what the mystery animal of the day is. Let's go for it here. If you've ever seen it before, this is a game a lot like Wordle, that word guessing game, except we're trying to guess what the mystery animal of the day is. And Mayor Space guesses skunk. I like that. A skunk is a kind of carnivorous mammal, which is a kind of placental mammal. It's a good place to start. We know this game is kind of heavily biased toward placental mammals. Although it hasn't been lately, which has been kind of nice. Well, let's try skunk to start with. Skunks are a kind of mustelid. And, oh boy, that is a great place to start. Because our mystery animal is not a mustelid, it's not a skunk, but it is a Laurasia there. Let me show you what that means. This wonderful clade of mammals, which I think includes us. Doesn't it? Let's jump to mammals real quick. On our tree of life here. Hey, Dreamt, welcome back. Yeah. All right. We've got mammals. You've got mammals. Therian mammals, placental mammals, Boroeutherian mammals, and then Laurasia therian mammals. 
So this is not going to be a, um, a UR Kanto Glyre. UR Kanto Glyres are rodents, primates, and more. We know it's not one of them. Instead of taking a right there, we got to take a left, because we know it's a Laurasia there. But, we can tell even more than that. Since we guessed skunk, skunk, and skunks are a kind of Laurasia there, We also know it's not going to be part of this group. This is, what, Scrotifera, I think it's called? This includes the carnivorin mammals, like this. A skunk is a kind of carnivorin. So skunks are going to be over here with weasels and their relatives. Yeah. It's not going to be one of them. It's not going to be a carnivorin. It might be a perissodactyl, though. Because, again, this is... Wait, where's Laurasia theory? Oh, Laurasia theory. Oh, shoot. It could also very well be uh, an even-toed ungulate. So, chat, give me the name of a hoofed mammal with either two toes or four toes. It's not a horse, but like a deer or a pig or a whale. Or a hippopotamus paleolore, that's a good one. Yeah, even toed ungulate, small boiled egg, yes. Um, let's try hippopotamus. Let's see if it's uh, a hippo or a cetacean. Oh, oh, oh boy! It is. Oh boy. Our mystery animal is part of clay to hippomorpha. These are the hippos and the whales. Whippomorpha is. Patrick Crusader. Thank you for the 10 months. I appreciate that. Thanks for keeping me online. Hey, thanks for keeping me online for the past 10 months. Let me drink some water here. Got almond fragments all over my mouth. Whales? Hippos? Whippo! There you go, Murph. Yeah. Yeah. Whippomorpha is this clade here. Um, right there. This is clade Whippomorpha. It's not labeled as such, but it includes hippos and whales. Whippomorpha is the name of the clade. Let me show you. Good stuff. Uh, Troodon is not within Whippomorpha. No, it's within. Well, it's an archosaur. It's within Dinosauria this is really Theropoda. Not what paleontology is like. Full metal talking. Thank you for the follow. No, full metal. Full metal L King. Thank you, full metal L King. It's good to have you here. Welcome to paleontologizing. Uh, um, so, since we guessed Hippo, and it doesn't say, oh yes, Hippo, it says Whippomorpha, we know that our critter is not going to be part of this clade. It's not a Hippo. So it's got to be a whale. There's two main clades of whales. There's the Odontocetes, which are the toothed whales, and there's the Mysticetes, which are the baleen whales, also known as the great whales. So, let's check Odontoceti first, because Odontocetes are more speciose. Let's look at, say... Let's try dolphin. When in doubt, go with a more derived clade of a speciose group. And it is a toothed whale, but it is not a dolphin. Which is interesting. Um, Delphinidae, which is uh, dolphins and their relatives. It also includes orcas. And belugas. Um, there we go, I think that's this clade here. And narwhals too. It's not gonna be one of those, I don't think. Unless they don't have that clade, but we'll see. Um, 
It could be a sperm whale. Let's try that. Let's try a sperm whale. And no. It's not a sperm whale. And it's not a dolphin. We had beluga recently, I think. And I know we had narwhal recently, so I doubt it's that. It could be orca. The reason I'm a little bit hesitant to just dump into that guess is because dolphins and orcas should share a clade together. And so it should have moved us down a rank into Delphinidae or something. Yeah. Or Delphinidae are the oceanic dolphins. Okay, well... Delphinoidea? Yeah, that might not be... I, I don't know if they have that rank, that particular clade on this. Let's try... Hold on to your butts. Let's try Orca. No. Okay, it is a... They did have Delph in it. Ah! They don't have River Dolphin. But they do have Beluga Whale. Let's try Beluga Whale. Um... Because they don't have Beaked Whale. It's got to be a Beluga. Let's try that. That was it right there. Very nice. Yeah. Um... Yeah, we got it in six guesses. That's not... Our best? Certainly not our best. That's not the worst, either. It was Beluga. Why did I think that we had Beluga recently? Maybe it was... Yeah, I don't know. These are really, really cool whales. Holy moly. Yeah. Here, take a look. Very intelligent animals, appreciative of many kinds of music. Uh... <laughs> this is one of my favorite videos. I love this. Yeah. the shape of their dome. Yeah, it's called a... That protuberance in front houses their melon, which is their echolocation echo organ. Soft tissue up there. It's not bound by bone. such cool critters. They really are. Um, and here, take a look at this. Beluga whale scares little girl.
Oh, they're very cool critters. Yeah, Very cool. Yeah, that whale knows what it's doing. Oh yeah, beards. Oh yeah. They are... They're clever critters. Yeah, they are... Uh... They're pretty neat. Here, take a look. These animals are also known as the white whale for their white color. Though yep. they aren't born this way. They took Baby Captain Ahab's leg. Are gray and don't become white until they reach reproductive maturity at Never. around five years of age. Beluga babies are born in shallow water estuaries and rivers where temperatures are warmer than the Arctic Ocean. Belugas are covered in blubber that can be up to four inches thick as adults, but they're more susceptible to cold temperatures when they're young. Mother hmm. belugas average 12 feet long and weigh up to 3,000 pounds. That's about wow. the same weight as a female hippopotamus. Although, unlike hippopotamus, they don't have to support their body weight on land, so it doesn't really count. The mother beluga gives birth to a single five-foot-long calf after a 14-month gestation period. When they gather together to mate, belugas can form groups numbering in the hundreds. However, outside of breeding, they form smaller pods of up to 15 members. Females remain with their calves who drink milk for up to two years. Oh, and Smurf, I'm so sorry. Things are going well. Um, I feel for your Smurf. That's really tough. And males form bachelor groups. Yeah. Once a year, they also gather to shed their outer layer of skin. Kind of like a reptile or an arthropod. But belugas are mammals and most closely related to the narwhal. Beluga hmm. whales are found exclusively in cold waters of the northern Whoa. hemisphere, with populations occurring almost the entirely shore. in the Arctic and subarctic regions. They are considered coastal animals, but have been known to venture over 400 miles out to sea and dive up to 1,000 feet below the waves. Huh. Belugas dive for food along the bottom of the ocean. These Probably dives typically last three to five minutes, but Mal can go as mollusks, long as 20. They find food using echolocation. We discussed this process in our bat episode, but to briefly recap, <laughs> echolocation is a type of sonar in which certain animals produce yep. high-pitched sounds that bounce off objects and return to the animal. In belugas, this is completed using their large, round head, which is called a melon. Their diet includes fish, crustaceans, and cephalopods, and is more varied than the diet of other cetaceans. When hmm. compared to other whales, belugas lack a distinct dorsal fin and, like river dolphins, have a flexible neck. Their faces yeah, are also really cool. flexible, which allows them to make facial expressions that they may use to <laughs> communicate. People often comment on their iconic smile. Belugas also communicate through sound. They are so vocal, they've earned the common name sea canary. While this doesn't have anything to do with canaries and coal mines, belugas are susceptible to pollutants in the water. They're also at risk of habitat destruction, such as the estuaries where they give birth to their young, and run-ins with boats. Natural predators to belugas include killer whales and polar bears who wait at breathing holes to grab belugas while they take hmm. in air. If they can avoid these threats, belugas may live to be 30 or older in the wild. Male belugas, who are slightly larger than females, are believed to live longer, and females, who only give birth every two to three years, stop breeding once they reach their early 20s and spend the rest of their lives in a postmenopausal state. Hmm. Like dolphins, belugas are toothed whales. Yep, odontoceps. More facts on belugas. Very cool. Here is a nice little video link right there. And, uh, good stuff. Very cool. They look so soft and cuddly. They do have a lot of personality, belugas. Yeah. Cool stuff. Now, let's get back to... our Beelzebufo here. As we discuss frogs for World Frog Day. Here we go. And Victarius, you got me the Sukumimus. Holy cow, Victarius. I really, really appreciate that. 
This is exquisite, and I really appreciate your generosity, Victarius. I really, really do. I promise to use this only for good. And it'll actually be really helpful as I do, I don't know, like, school visits and stuff like that, when I talk about Spinosaurid dinosaurs. Um, yeah. I'll be publishing the Spinosaur paper soon, and um, this will be really helpful. Maybe even as I do some press around it. Like, I might even include it in a press release video or something. So thank you, thank you, Victarius. I really appreciate that. I really do. Um, in fact, uh, there we go. Anyway, let's continue here. This isn't quite what he was hoping for. Fifty foot long <laughs> Rapito soils. have been attracted here by the promise of a mud bath. So this doesn't necessarily make the largest frog that ever lived look very large. Their timing couldn't be much worse. Seventy tons of soil. Oh. This was a good bit, Salamander. I like it. I like it. Uh, Time is short. Female devil toads will only mate at the start of the rainy season. Close captions. There we go. Mark says, could a sauropod lay on its side? Certainly, yeah. That's how they would have slept. Um... We also, I think, have direct evidence of these animals lying on their sides. Uh, I, I want to say we have trackway evidence of that. But yeah, yeah. This whole idea that, that people seem to have that like, oh, you know, big animals don't lie down on their sides, you know? Um, you know, that's where this like urban myth of cow tipping came from. It was like country folks making fun of city folks and being like, yeah, we Watch you. Let's go out cow tipping. It's like, no, cows sleep on their sides. Have you never seen a cow sleep? Like, they sleep on their sides. On the ground. Um, horses often do too, you know? Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. So, um, but sore buds, even as big as they were, they could very much lie on their sides, Murph, I think, yeah. Um, they wouldn't want to flop on their sides or they might break something, might shatter their ribs, but you know, lying down more or less gently, I think that'd be more than fine, you know? Yeah. And Le Petit says, don't you know that cows in the mountains have short and long legs too? Yeah, well, they have, they have short legs on one side so that they can, they can walk on the side of a mountain, um, and, you know, keep their body level. Um, and that, no, there's actually a, there's a, fearsome critters, or tall tail animals, jokingly said to inhabit the wilderness in and around logging camps, especially in the Great Lakes region. Um, one of them was the animal with longer legs on one side. Yeah. Uh, the side hill gouger, an animal legged for hillsides, having legs on one side taller than the other, thus always having to travel on hillsides. And then, like when two of them, you know, one of them has shorter right, shorter legs on the right side, and one of them has shorter le legs on the left side, and then they have to they have to move in like concentric circles around the around the hill. And then, if they ever run into each other, they have to fight to the death because they can't—they can't go backwards. So, anyway, this is an old joke. But 
Yeah, Jackalope is actually one of those fearsome critters. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Fearsome critters. Uh, the fur-bearing trout, <laughs> snail chaser. Yeah, snail chaser, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I made sure to text snail chaser at chat because snail chaser is very interested in frogs and is hoping to adopt some frogs sometime soon. Now that he's got a, now that he's got a new place, we are talking about the largest frog that has ever lived, Bale Zabufo. This is a clip from Prehistoric Planet Two. This came out last year. He's gonna try and make it to that. That little pool over there. But he's gotta run the gauntlet of the sauropods. Reaching it will be dangerous. some thought that Pac-Man frogs might be related? Yeah. But we're not really sure. We've got another video lined up that'll talk about that. Finally, he's got there. But he's been noticed. A devil toad for nothing. Uh. Time to try more singing. But he can't make himself heard above the sound yep. of Too loud. sauropods. That's the neighborhood. Those noisy dinosaurs. Luckily for him, there's one thing that repeatosaurs enjoy even more than wallowing in mud. And that is food. They're gonna go get some food. Thankfully, they don't eat frogs. The hungry herd. Fortunately for Bales of Oop. Although, not without leaving something useful behind. of giant footprints full of water lucky him perfect for a Beelzebufo to continue his quest for a mate stuff. The devil toad can only survive here because every year the land is flooded by seasonal rains. Yeah, amphibians in general are, are tied to moisture. Some amphibians, some frogs especially, can still survive in places like deserts, but they have to find a way to keep their skin moist. More so than, say, their reptile contemporaries do. Anyway. Back to Bales of Bufo, our video here. Yeah. These frogs are related. Bales of Bufo yeah. is only known from Madagascar around 70 million years ago. And Madagascar and South America haven't been connected for like 115 million years. Yeah. So if these frogs are related, paleontologists have to explain how they ended up in totally separate isn't places. Isn't that cool, Salamander? And figure yeah. out where and when yeah. their ancestors lived. And if it turns out that they aren't related, then why do they look so similar? Untangling the origins of Beelzebufo, the giant frog that lived alongside the dinosaurs, turns out to be one of the most bedeviling problems in the history of amphibians. Oh, I see what he did there. 
The first fossils of Vyasa were collected in 1993 in the Madrunga Basin of Madagascar, <laughs> and more bits yeah. and pieces were found each field season after that. But this odd frog wasn't fully described until 2008, once there was enough of it to compare it to other living and extinct frogs. And that comparison to living frogs is where the trouble started. Even before the discovery of a partial cranium in 2010, it was clear that Beelzebufo really looked like a Pac-Man frog that had somehow ended up on the wrong continent. And the <laughs> devil frog also turned out to be just really big. The biggest modern frogs live in Africa and are known as Goliath frogs. Yeah. These chunky boys can get up to just over 30 centimeters long and weigh more than three kilograms. So let's take a look at some Goliath frogs. We'll take a brief detour from this again. They are really cool. Um, they're pretty darn neat. Yeah. Here, take a look at this. This is Andre Nicodi. He's on the lookout for Goliath frogs. nicodi has been hunting these creatures for decades, but they're a lot harder to find now. 2003, when I enter here, I'd enter for school day. So this is when I walked there, there as soon as I got there. Like I was going to catch at least 20 frogs. You get plenty. There were many. Goliath frogs are the biggest frog species in the world. They can grow up to 32 centimeters long and weigh over three kilograms. They're a major source of income for hunters like Nakodi, who could sell them for up to 10 US dollars. We manage over our life. Right now, so I get. I, for example, have two kids in college. It was the money from those frogs that allowed me to send them to school. But the Goliath frog is endangered because of overhunting and habitat loss. The Cameroon government has stepped in to protect the frogs. Now, Nakodi looks for frogs not to sell them, but to help study them. He works hmm. with a conservation group to learn more about the Goliaths and their environment. They Very also cool. explain to other people that hunting frogs is not allowed anymore. You know, get law. The government, the projects, take care of the frogs. I stopped hunting them, he says. That's how I educate the people in the village. To make up for the loss of frog income, conservationists have come up with other programs to help people make money. But they worry that stricter rules will be needed to keep these giants safe. Devin Tsai and Eric Gao for Taiwan Plus. It's, heart, you know, it's heartening to see... People who used to be contributing to the extinction of these animals now turn around and contribute to their conservation instead. Let's just hope it's not too late. Also um, known as giant slippery frogs, these frogs are the largest living frogs on Earth. They can yeah. reach the size of a small house cat weighing over seven pounds and reaching more than a Holy foot yeah. in length. And that's <laughs> not with their legs stretched out. Unfortunately, oh, they're also endangered. Goliath frogs face overhunting and habitat loss. All that size makes for a huge meal of frog legs. But, because their populations are so low, they're protected. Sadly, this doesn't stop some people from- So that reminds me, shoot, brief story time. When I was a kid, um, during the summers, uh, both my parents would be at work. And so I would go stay with, uh, stay with some friends and, um, and their mom would watch me during the summers when my parents were at work and I always thought that this family had kind of weird eating habits to the point where I like I often thought they were joking about stuff that they were eating so one day for lunch uh, the mom asked me oh Danny you know uh, we're gonna be having frog legs for lunch how many do you want and of course I laughed politely like haha funny funny joke Funny joke. And she was like, why are you laughing? This is not a joke. And I was horrified. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, it turns out that they ate frog legs all the time and it was like, it's just normal for them. But there are other things that they ate too that they acted like we're completely normal, and I don't think we're completely normal. Like, one of their favorite meals was just to eat jars of baby food. And they're like, oh, it's so, it's so nutritious and wholesome. Do you want some? And like, I thought they were kidding at first. Do I want to eat baby food? Not a baby. What are you talking about? And... 
so I, I don't know. I bring that up to to raise the point that like they were hard to parse. It was hard to understand. There were certain things that they thought were normal that I thought were really really weird. And some of those things apparently are kind of like I guess people actually eat frogs' legs. But I still think that eating baby food out of jars as an adult or as like a eight-year-old child is still kind of weird, right? Am I crazy, or or is that actually weird? Um. Yeah. The salamander says, no, it's definitely weird. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm poaching them anyway. Goliath frogs are native to a small section of Western Africa. Where they spend their time in rainforest the habitats. The baby food thing, They're yeah. most commonly found <laughs> in rivers that aren't completely covered by the tree canopy, uh, but they always stay near clean, oxygen rich, swift moving sources of water, including waterfalls. And Beats International says, to be honest, a family sitting down to eat baby food sounds weirder than eating frog legs. I still think eating frog legs sounds 10 times weirder. Because it's a frog's legs. You know, I. But whatever. I'm not one to talk. I don't, I don't eat meat. Falls. They may uh, be shipped overseas for jumping contests as they can leap nearly 10 uh, feet horizontally. But this just adds to their population decline. Oh, it's been suggested awful, yeah. they may have such a restricted range because their tadpoles are picky eaters, only oh. consuming a certain type of aquatic plant native to their home. Huh. Goliath frog tadpoles are the same size as average frog tadpoles at first. But they keep growing, and growing, and growing. HD says, not as weird as eating buffalo wings. I, buffalo don't even have wings, you know? Bison, famously. Terrestrial animals. They lack wings. So that is pretty weird. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Something weird about these frogs is that the males are larger than the females. Oh! Yeah, and most frogs, the females, are larger. There's a name for that. I forget what it is. It's not sexual dimorphism, but there's a specific name for the when the female is larger than the male. A lot of birds of prey are like this. A lot of falcons, eagles, hawks, um, owls, too, I think. Um, and frogs, too. The females tend to be larger. Um, carrying the eggs seems to have... Uh, if you're larger, your body can produce more eggs, which gives your, your offspring a better chance of survival. And so that's like an evolutionary trait that they've evolved. To be redundant for a second. An evolutionary trait that they've evolved. In order to give their offspring a better chance at survival. Peregrine falcons um, are the same, where the female is a lot larger than the male. And there's an interesting idea about peregrine falcons. Um, I forget where I read it, but it's... The idea is that the female is so much larger than the male because it also gives the offspring a better shot at survival. And that when both parents are out hunting, they can catch a wider variety of prey. The female, being larger, might go after, like, ducks. Or herons or like other larger birds like that whereas the male is going to be catching things like sparrows things like sanderlings or small sandpipers critters like that so you've got a wider variety of prey that can be caught by two adults that are different sizes i just heard this idea recently for the first time and it it makes a lot of sense um but i wonder how you'd actually go about testing that in a scientific way uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm aware, Mayor Space. I'm just feigning ignorance, as I often do about these things. Um, hopefully Quinn will be with us in the field again this year in Wyoming, and he can, uh, he can tell us about Buffalo, New York, because that's where he's from. 
But, uh, yeah, anyway. Let's continue. Frogs, the ladies outweigh the lads. It's believed goliath frog males may come in larger sizes because males construct nesting areas by digging depressions in sandy stream beds <laughs> and, and clearing yes, their indeed. areas of leaf litter and large rocks. They have to be strunk in order to push those boulders. Though they're big boys, they don't make large calls. They lack vocal sacs. It should be noted, however, though many that's sources say they're mute, that's only half true. These frogs do make noise, just not in the same way as most other frogs. They make whistles and grunts to serenade their partners. Males will compete with each other <laughs> over breeding rights to nearby ladies. Not an actual recording. The there. female lays anywhere from 100 to over 2,000 sticky eggs, which attach to vegetation and other surfaces in the nesting area. Hmm. The adults will stick around the nest, protecting it, though it's not currently known how long they may remain at the nest. After hatching, it takes about three months for the tadpoles to fully develop. In the wild, they're believed to live more than a decade, though most captive individuals really? don't I live more than no a few years. For giving boss, I appreciate that, Smart. Thank you for giving me a month up to the just months. I appreciate that, Smart. Thank you, thank you. But how sticky are the eggs? They're pretty sticky, Snail Chain. They're sticky enough to stick to a substrate. Goliath frog eggs may be eaten uh. by freshwater shrimp. As adults, their large size often offers them protection, and they change their activity based on their size. Younger hmm. frogs generally stay in the water, uh. while larger individuals spend more time basking on rocks outside of the water. They can afford the freedom, but they're often within hopping distance of the water's safety. Hmm. Goliath frogs are mostly active at night, and hunt food such as crabs and other crustaceans, fish, mollusks like snails, uh. spiders, other frogs, and small birds and mammals. There was huh. even a goliath frog found with a bat in its stomach. Thank you to our patrons, Very cool. Spike Spiegel. Uh, neat stuff. Neat stuff. Here's a link to this video from Animal Fact Files. Good stuff. A bat in his stomach. I wonder if the bat fell into the water, or if that frog snatched that bat out of the air. Pretty cool. Anyway, back to Bale's Abufo. That had somehow ended no. up on the wrong continent. And the devil frog also turned out to be the beef just frog. Really What's that, big. snail chaser? The biggest Is beef frog a nickname for... <laughs> for a frog that you came up with? Is it like, um... Oh boy, is it like this? Uh... Uh... Here we go. This is Chichile. He's one of the workers here at the Ancon field station. And he's taking us to this old mine shaft that is home to some sort of mysterious frog. I've been told they're big and they're purple. They've only been seen in this cave. And I'm going to try to identify them. Huh. Herpetologist Jeff Corwin here. One of my heroes growing up. I used to watch him on Animal Planet all the time. There's some bats. Grande. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, ay, ay. Look at my legs. Oh, God, that can't be good. Three feet of bat crap. But look at the size uh, of this frog. Look at this. Yeah. Remember when I said I'd kill you last? I <laughs> lied. Uh. That's his defense right there. He's like... Huh? Not so mysterious. And while this animal is found throughout South America, it is the first time I've seen it in Central America. Oh, look at that frog. Look at that. He's got pectoral muscles. I mean, he could pop a cap off a, off a, off a, off a soda bottle. And look at those arms. <laughs> Out in the forest, you'd find these guys eating insects. Ah, pumping the iron. System, they're eating bats. I live in the cave. I eat bats. On the salt beach. Ugh. 
<laughs> the ladies love this. See those spines in his chest? That means it's mating season. And his muscular appearance helps him more effectively mount the females. And those spines, well, they help him hold on. Listen here. I'm speaking to you. You're really getting on my nerves. I'm gonna put your your head in my arms and I'm just gonna pop your eyes out like that. Cool frogs. Leptodactylus pentadactylus. It was great that we could come here, solve this little mystery, and move on our merry way. I'm amazed by this. Very surreal, very exciting experience. <laughs> I've never seen one this big. He's been eating bats, he's been eating fish. And there he goes, back into the cave. Woo! Good for him. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And then, Snail Chaser, you sent a, a link here. What is this? The Beef Frog? I think is that's this? one, guys. Got him. There it is! Holy cow! I cannot believe we found the frog. Oh, my. <laughs> oh man, uh. I am super excited. The creature that we're looking for tonight is probably one of the most bizarre animals that could be found in Australia. And we oh. have featured some interesting things over the years on Brave Wilderness, but I can promise you there. nothing yeah. compares to the turtle frog. We needed rain to find this frog. A turtle frog. And the rains have come. You are not going to miss this. Finding a turtle huh. frog is almost impossible because you have to be in the small remote desert they live in Western Australia while it's raining. And this uh. only happens a few times a year. Yes! Yes! Next to no footage exists of this species. If we find one, this will be the very first high quality footage ever seen. Oh! Stop the car, I see something on the road. First animal of the night, a really cool lizard. Oh my gosh, it's got a huge tick on him though. I'm gonna try Oof. to pull this off. Look at that, got a tick. Oh my yeah, gosh, you see that? Oh. That is a big tick. Oh. That is a really cool lizard. Very good sign for our search tonight. We're not exactly uh. looking for shinglebacks, but this one was crossing the road, so we wanted to move him out of the way. You're welcome, all right. Let's let you go oh. off the road so you can continue on your way and we'll continue on ours. This rain has the animals on the move. Like all amphibians, turtle frogs need moisture to survive and to breed. That is yep. why they come up to the surface after it rains. Without this rain, the frogs will remain buried beneath the ground. So let's skip to where they find it, shall we? I cannot believe we found the frog. Oh. Uh, <laughs> beat him the tick. Yeah, there you go, Commodore. Oh my goodness. Hello. Oh my gosh. We have come so far to find this species. There is the turtle frog. Look at that. It kind of does look like a turtle, doesn't it? Yeah, baby. Woo! <laughs> what are the freaking odds, guys? Wow. Oh my gosh. I cannot believe. We got one. Oh. Look at that. Hello. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? This is one of the coolest creatures I have ever laid my eyes on. Let's just appreciate this super unique creature. What you're looking at is some of the first HD footage ever recorded of a turtle frog. I mean, this species is so rare, there's very little information to find about them. But here's what we do know about this bizarre little frog. Hmm. Let's start with the name, turtle frog. Named for its appearance, the most unusual frog I have ever seen. But look at its head, that dome-shaped head with the black beady little eyes. And then the circular body looks like a turtle without a shell. This is one of the yeah, most reminds me of like a turtle. looking frogs like turtle. you will ever see. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt's relative. Some people say it looks like a, a little wad of chewing gum, and it certainly looked like that when we first saw it. I have wanted to film. I have wanted to find one of these frogs for my entire career. This is a, a big, big moment for me. You can't sense my excitement after this. This is about as big as it gets for a frog nerd like me. Very Hi, cool. buddy. Look at that pudge. Are you kidding me? 
has to be one of the most unique looking frogs, but probably the cutest frogs as well. Super pudgy, super soft. <laughs> Feels like a, a water balloon almost. And when it's walking across my hand, you can really tell. They dig forward like a turtle. Yeah, most, most frogs dig the with frogs. their back legs. Like a, like, a like back into, water the, balloon. into the mud. But it is a very delicate cool. frog, but it's somewhat stout. Got a lot of power in those legs. I can feel it when it's crawling across my hand. It uses its stocky arms and legs to burrow into the soil. It really is incredible how something so small and soft can dig over three feet underground. And actually here, let me get out. I'm gonna take my pack off and uh, get out a little bit of water because I don't want to dry out the frog. One of the things you always want to make sure you do when handling any amphibian <laughs> is make sure you don't dry them out and this yeah. water will, will help. Oh, hey, came to life there. Hey, buddy, it's all right. Oh my goodness. Endemic to Western Australia. It can yeah, only be only found here, there. but that's not where the oddities end. In fact, the oddities begin with this species when it's born. It's one of the few species of frogs on the planet that does not have a tadpole stage. Really? This frog begins its life with a full set of hands. I did legs. not know that. That's What's wild. What's also unique about this species is that they have one of the largest eggs of all frogs. That makes a lot of sense. So I bet you they don't very they don't lay very many of them either. If the frogs are more well developed when they hatch, if they actually are fully formed with legs and everything, they don't go through a tadpole stage. I'm guessing that a that the eggs are larger, there are fewer of them, and uh, and they they spend a long time kind of developing in the mother before the the eggs get laid. If well, if they have internal fertilization, which I assume they do, they might not. In Australia, in fact, five centimeters is as big as they grow, and this frog is approaching maximum length. Now, there's a certain period of year where at the tail end of it, uh, that it's breeding and will actually call. That's how we were able to find this frog. And it was definitely a team effort. We've got Max with us here uh, from Australia Wildlife Encounters. Max and I were slowly honing in on this little frog, and then I crouched down and there it was, just like you saw it right there <laughs> underneath the bush. Very Looking cool. right back at us yeah. with those beady little eyes. And it was so unlikely for us to find this frog, guys. The rains were not supposed to come, and sure enough, they appear today, almost like out of thin air, a front came in, provided enough moisture for us to have a chance to put this frog in front of the cameras. And I am so excited you guys get to see it. Now, we think this is a male because of the way it was calling. And huh. when they're mating, they have an extended honeymoon. Once a turtle frog locates its mate, they will both burrow together for months before actually breeding and depositing their eggs. This is a, a very unique species, guys. There's not a ton of information and very few studies of this frog. That's actually something that's not too surprising. For the ma vast majority of, of living animal species on Earth, there are not very many studies on them. There are a bunch of different animals for which there's basically no information in the scientific literature, apart from like an initial description. Um, you'd be shocked at the the paucity of data, the, the lack of of information about different aspects of different animals biology in the scientific literature. We need more scientists out there studying different critters and publishing on them. And yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, really cool. Thank you for sharing snail chaser. This is really neat. Here's a link again, if anybody wants to watch the whole thing, but this is a, uh, this is a treat. It's very cool. And the idea that they don't go through a tadpole stage is really, really interesting. Um, because, well, shoot. The stages that frogs undergo, how a tadpole becomes a frog, is, is really fascinating and really dramatic. Ontogeny. So yeah, there's male and female frog, male much smaller than the female, male's fertilizing the eggs. Those eggs are gonna be stuck to that end of that leaf until they hatch. 
Yeah. Let's start oh, interesting, Snail Chaser. I didn't know that. Most frogs go through this process. And this is so cool. Really neat here. After just a week, they look like that. See those tadpoles developing in there? Hatch. They just take a dive. Not unlike a soccer player. No, they land on the water, though. <laughs> Metamorphosis. This is pretty impressive ontogenetic change. So, we talk a lot about ontogeny on this channel. Dinosaurs also changed a lot as they grew and developed. I guess we call this... Ontogeny. Yeah. But this is not nearly as dramatic as the ontogenetic changes that frogs undergo. Ontogeny. Uh... Yeah. Holy cow. Pretty neat. And so you see them developing those back legs like that. So the arms, if I'm not mistaken, are actually... Yeah, they're developing internally. And then they kind of push out. They, like, break through the body wall at a certain point. Yep, just like that. Yeah, you can see the outline of the fingers right there. See? Right there. It's getting ready to burst out of the body wall. Burst out of the skin, rather. I guess not the body wall, but just a layer of skin that they have there. Yeah. So this is what most frogs do. Yeah. Is that neat, so to speak? Yeah. So that tail gets resorbed over time. Yeah. It literally, it literally resorbs into the body. And then you get an adult frog. So the next time that you see a frog, you know, I like to think about this a lot. Every time I see a frog, you're looking at a very, very lucky individual animal where it happened to be an egg that developed properly and then the tadpole emerges from that egg and then that tadpole is able to find food and survive. And like that frog has gone on a tremendous journey to be able to actually reach its full adult frog stage. And most of the young don't make it, obviously. So anytime the, the next time you see a frog, you know, give him a little paleo salute. Like, wow, you've managed to run the gauntlet. Good for you. Really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. And Sculpin. Lots of species not said it. Yeah, Sculpin, this is true. This is true. Yeah, I think that might be a glass frog right there. Pretty neat. Now, uh, before we get back to Bale's Abufa, I want to show you another really, really cool frog that a lot of people are probably not aware of. A flying frog. And no, that is not a joke. Flying frogs. Take a look. The gliding tree frog lives almost exclusively in the treetops of dense tropical jungles. Like Borneo, I think. Of feet above the forest floor. The tree frog spends its days ambling through the canopy along vines and branches. Yeah. It uses its large sticky hands and feet to grip onto any available foliage. Feeling bit plasticity? Height, yeah. Any step could be fatal. So slow and steady is the An game. An interesting axe, man. Neat. 
And yeah, Snail Chaser, it's... Falling to their death is not the tree frog's only concern. The canopy is also home uh, to a deadly predator. The tree boa. Uh, it is thin, lightweight, and lightning fast. Fall machine, very funny. The sure-footed tree frog <laughs> is an easy target. Oh, you'd think it would be. The snake moves effortlessly through the branches, closing in on the frogs. It looked like they were filmed at different times, I'm gonna be honest. With nowhere to hide, the frogs take a leap of faith. <laughs> As they plummet uh. toward the forest floor, they extend their hands and feet to unravel their large, <laughs> extensive webbing. Pretty cool. It's a natural parachute. They are not so much flying as falling with style. Yeah. <laughs> CG here is really funny to me. A uh, thin layer of skin between their fingers and toes acts like a parachute. Lateral skin flaps along their arms and legs uh, also catch the air. Like a Draco as lizard. They free fall. This increased surface area provides enough air resistance to slow an otherwise fatal descent into a controlled glide. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Like a skydiver, the frog makes small, subtle movements to steer its way to safety up to 50 feet away. Yep. Pretty neat. The flexible skeletons are modified to absorb the shock on landing. Wow. While their oversized sticky toe pads once again grip on for dear life. Pretty cool. With the snake left high and dry, the gliding tree frog disappears back into the jungle. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. From uh, Smithsonian Channel. Here's a link to that right there. There's a nice BBC one with David Attenborough as well, but... Uh, probably would have been better, but... I would have to mute the sound for YouTube, and that's a pain in the butt, so we watch this one instead. Also good stuff. Yeah. Now back to... Beelzebufo here. We talked about Goliath frogs, we talked about... The turtle frog. Thank you, Snail Chaser. We talked about gliding frogs. Now back to the largest frog that's ever lived. Um, and are there flying snakes? There literally are, Patrick Crusader. Um, gliding snakes, at least. Yeah. I think they live in the same place. Um. Yeah. Here, take a look at this. There are five species of snakes in the Malaysian jungles that are able to transform their skeletons to glide through the air. The study yep. has revealed exactly how these gliding snakes contort their bodies to cover a great deal of ground. When it leaps off a high tree branch, it rotates its ribs forwards and upwards, making its body double in width. So this cool. This transforms it into a much flatter aerodynamic shape, similar to an airplane wing. <laughs> yes, it moves its head back and forth, which passes waves down its... <laughs> that does kind of work, doesn't it, actually? Um, yeah... Airplane wing. 
It moves its head back and forth, which passes waves down its body like it's swimming. I don't air. know if they have Professor venom. Professor Jake carried good, out the study by creating a plastic copy of the snake's cross section and placed it in a tank of flowing water and gathered data on the way the water moves around it using lasers and high speed cameras. Hmm. Cool stuff. Yeah. And I wonder if we can find a link to the paper right there. Um. Well, here's New York Times video about flying snakes. Yeah. That is a flying snake leaping from a tree and gliding through the air. Now, try not to think of that as a complete nightmare. Instead, think of it as uh, a unique it's problem cool. in aerodynamics. It's so cool. That's what scientists at Virginia Tech are Snakes doing. get such a bad They're rap. They're studying that undulating serpent one step or undulation at a time. They figured out a while ago how the snakes move through the air by launching or throwing the snakes from a platform and watching them snake through their glide. Now they've used a 3D printer to make a cross-section of the snake's body, which it flattens in order to help it fly. They put huh. the 3D model in a tank and watched water flow around it to I see the what same the study. of that flattening was. That works because from a physicist's point of view, water and air are both fluids. At the right angle, between 15 and 40 degrees, hmm. the sideways snake wing worked pretty well. It got better lift than some traditional wing shapes. Nobody's huh. building a flying snake robot yet, which is probably a good thing. But aerodynamics is always hungry for new knowledge, and there is nothing natural or man-made that flies like a snake. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh... Good stuff. Here's a link to this video right here for you. Uh, um, right now, the dinosaurs rule. And the Vinyl Frontier, how are you doing? Welcome back to Paleo... Oh, welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you for the follow. It's good to have you here. Uh, um, but I agree, gliding snakes are cool, Golden Eye. I think mildly venomous means if it bites you, you're 100% good. Probably snail chaser, yeah. You know, like bees are mildly venomous. You're gonna be okay unless, uh, unless it, unless you're allergic. Um, yeah. Anyway, back to the largest frog that's ever lived, which lived alongside the dinosaurs. Uh, and maybe, thank you, Vinyl Frontier. I appreciate that. Welcome. <laughs> Modern frogs live in Africa and are known as Goliath frogs. Uh, These chonky boys are just not over 30 centimeters either. long and weigh more than three kilograms. But the largest <laughs> estimates put Beelzebufo around 40 centimeters long and four and a half kilograms. And based on its features, we can get at least some insights into what its ancient habitat was like and maybe even its behavior. For nice. example, based on its limb proportions, the devil frog probably walked on land rather than hopping from tree to tree like some frogs do. Oh. And its big blobby shape and short limbs would have helped keep it from drying out as quickly as a smaller frog would have. It also may have been a burrower, using its back legs to dig into the soil and make Static a nice oh, place okay. to hang out during the hottest and driest parts of the year. Is that this a is something that frogs and toads still do if they live in seasonal environments. Cool but where things start to get weird is its head. Beelzebufo had what's called a hyperossified cranium. Yeah, uh, so I've never, I I've promise I've not seen this video before, but just hyperossified means you got a lot of bone. It's Overly bonified. Hyperossified means you got a lot of bones going on in there. Probably more than a typical frog. Um, I've got a, you know, printed out here a diagram of a frog skeleton on the wall for today, and we definitely have got more bone going on in Beelzebufo than in that critter. Meaning that it had extra bone tissue yeah. that formed a series of pits and ridges. There you go, salamander. Skull, yeah, giving it yeah. a bumpy texture. It also had an extremely wide mouth and was probably capable of biting really hard. Mm. In a study published in 2017, researchers measured the bite forces of living Pac-Man frogs, then scaled those measurements up to estimate the bite force of Beelzebufo. Ooh. And they found that the devil frog may have had a bite as strong as a snapping turtle with a similar Holy head cow. size. And pound for pound could even have rivaled that of a lion or a tiger. Wow. So in a biting contest between Beelzebufo, the devil toad, and a lion shrunk down to the same size. 
Oh, shoot. I'm putting my money on the frog. <laughs> Living frogs with morphologies like Beelzebufo tend to be aggressive ambush predators. So the devil frog probably was one, too. Its powerful bite may even have allowed it to prey on small crocodilians or even juvenile dinosaurs. A frog that hunted baby dinosaurs? It's possible, because several dinosaur species have been found in the same formation where Beelzebufo was found. Yep, and this is a almost a trope in paleo art at this point. It has appeared, I think, in numerous different documentaries featuring this critter. We already watched the Prehistoric Planet one, but, um... Yeah. Here, what about this? Also known as the Devil Frog, the largest known frog to ever hop the earth. Yeah. Oh, he got squished. Yowza. Well, what goes around goes around. Okay, but so. And actually, yeah, here. To outline the idea that this is like a trope, um, Bale's a bufo. Let's just look. There's one attacking a baby Mashiachosaurus. Same there. Uh, here's one wearing a cowboy hat. That's actually pretty awesome. Shoot, if you want to buy that, here's uh, a link. Um, there we go again. Yeah. Oh, come on. Well, there's another one. I don't know if it's going to open up properly. But yeah, shoot. It has become a trope at this point. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. All of this weirdness aside, the thing that really perplexes us about Hey, Mahoodles, how are you doing? Where welcome, exactly welcome. From. The key question is, <laughs> did Beelzebub Good to see you, just look like a Pac-Man frog, or was it actually related to them? Pac-Man oh. frogs live in places a lot like where Beelzebufo lived, in warm, arid habitats with pools of water that dry up seasonally. And modern Pac-Man frogs and Ms. Pac-Man... Stop, I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Reganation? Thank you for the nine months of support. Now at tier three, holy cow, Reagan Nation. Thank you, thank you for that support. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Holy moly. Thanks for keeping me here on the air. Thank you for supporting science outreach here on Twitch. And happy World Frog Day to you, Reagan Nation. Patrick Crusader says, apparently this frog appeared when the non-avian dinosaurs went legs up 66 million years ago. Is it a coincidence, or is the devil frog the reason the non-avian dinosaurs died out? Well... I can see that my, uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Well, holy cow, sculpin' 10 months at tier 3 now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Holy moly, do I appreciate that, sculpin'. Scopin and Reganation both at tier three. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support above and beyond at tier three. That means you get emotes like these. And of course, these. Not available to the tier one subscribers. Thank you, both of you. I know you're not subscribing oh, for the emotes here. Thank you, Golgonek, for the 100 bits. I appreciate that, Golgonek. Um, I know you, Reganation and Sculpin, you're not subscribing at Tier 3 to get those special emotes. Even though it is a perk, you're here trying to support science outreach here on Twitch. And we didn't come here to fight with monsters. We came here to find fossils. Zen Cynic, thank you for the follow. Oh, and Sculpin, thank you for the 100 bits there. Lovely. Good stuff. We got a hype train going. Beautiful. 
I really appreciate your support. Holy cow. We've got an amazing 70 million year old dinosaur. That meddler. And they're perfectly preserved. Mm -hmm. Cool. The kid. <laughs> thank you for the 20 months, Bat Meddler. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Um, and Oscar Juniors, thank you for gifting Mahoodles. Oscar JRS gifted a tier one sub to Mahoodles. I really they appreciate have given that, Oscar. Thank you, thank you. Channel. Beautiful. Thank you kindly. And look, we are approaching our, our sub goal. We're almost two thirds of the way there now. Uh, our last stream for the week is tomorrow. I'm not streaming on Friday. So, uh... Yeah, we'll see if we get there. Reagan Nation, thank you for those five gift subs. Reagan Nation really <laughs> I appreciate wants that, to Reagan Nation. Those five gift subs. Thank you for your support of science, science here on Twitch, Reagan Nation. There's five people in the chat who won't even have to think about ads on this channel for the next 30 days. Thank you, Reagan Nation. Thank you, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Holy cow. Thank you for your generosity. And with that, we're only 30 subs away from our, our goal for the whole week. We're more than two thirds of the way there now. Thank you, Reagan Nation. We're we're almost on schedule. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Um. Shall we get back to our video here? We might have some more subs come in, and we'll see. But for now, let's try and keep the science going. Let's continue this lovely video from PBS Eons about the largest frog that's ever lived, as far as we know, from the late Cretaceous Madagascar. Frogs are also large predators with hyperossified skulls. Hmm. Now, it's possible that this is a case of convergent evolution, where species with similar lifestyles develop similar adaptations. In this right. case, giant mouths and body shapes and sizes that allow them to survive dry spells. But if they are actually related, well, we have a problem. Because then we have to explain how Beelzebufo ended up only in Madagascar, while Pac-Man frogs are found only in South America. I mean, a big part of this might just be that we're lacking Maastrichtian, you know, strata from Southern Africa. Uh, well, you might expect to find remains of them in places like Patagonia for the Maastrichtian. We do have Maastrichtian strata here in Argentine Patagonia. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. In order for the ancestors of Beelzebufo and Pac-Man frogs to have spread to both places, there would have to have been a connection between Madagascar and South America by way of Antarctica. But hmm. we now know that Madagascar was fully separated from Antarctica by around 115 million to 112 million years ago. Uh. So this means that the group of frogs that was ancestral to Pac-Man frogs had to first evolve into its own distinct group, and then migrate to Madagascar before 112 million years ago, assuming they got there by land. But so far, hmm. the science says that just wasn't the case. Molecular clock studies suggest that, at the earliest, those ancestors... In all the world, frogs, there are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. All of a sudden... Thank you for those five gifts. Of Three of them are leading this expedition. I really appreciate that all of a sudden. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. All of a sudden, 42 just gifted. Five subs. Thank you, thank you, all of a sudden. Thank you, thank you for that. There are five very happy chatters now. We're now inoculated against ads for the next 30 days. Thank you, all of a sudden, for your generosity and your support. And Ironbark, holy cow! Ten gift subs from Ironbark. Well, well, well. Look at this beautiful Tenemu bird. Celebrating the gifting of 10 subs there. Certainly something to get excited about. Maybe not that excited though. Uh oh. Oh shoot. Get out of there. It's gonna blow. Ironbark72 is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Thank you. Thank you, Ironbark. Holy moly. Do I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Phenomenal. 
We're only 14 subs away from our goal for the whole week now. This is excellent. It's really excellent. Stegosaurus, 25 feet long, weighing four tons. A versatile sort of chap. He won a lot of arguments in his time, but very few beauty contests. <laughs> Steely Dan. Hi, let's go. Thank you, thank you for the six months of support. And yes, frog hype indeed. Happy World Frog Day to you, Steely Dan. Good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Really cool. Yeah. Um. Lovely. Thank you for your support. Um. Yeah, Miss Yvette, does anybody remember the game Frogger? Oh, yeah, of course. And you have untogenized? There you go, Steely Dan. Yeah. Look at that sub badge there. Very nice. Um, good stuff. And we're 94% of the way to a level 5 hype train. Beautiful. Only 14 subs away from our weekly goal. I think we might make it. It's lovely. Uh... Yeah. There. Let's continue with our video here, trying to figure out the origins of these groups, Pac-Man frogs and Bales of Bufo. They probably don't. They probably aren't directly linked. Bales of Bufo is probably not a direct descendant, or a direct ancestor, excuse me, of the Pac-Man frogs. Um, but let's continue. It didn't evolve until 88 million years ago, long after Madagascar had already broken away. Now, the fossil record may provide some evidence that this group originated earlier, but the record is still really spotty. So hmm. the timing just doesn't work for these ancestors of... If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Reese Dago. <laughs> Pac-Man frogs are your favorite frogs, Reese Dago? Very nice. Um, Pac-Man frogs to get to yeah. Madagascar by land. Uh, okay, but what about rafting? We know other animal groups made it to the island by riding on random, naturally formed rafts of plant material. So, hmm. could the ancestors of this giant, scary frog have done the same thing? Well, even if they did get to Madagascar after it split off by rafting, the molecular clock estimates for when Pac-Man frogs originated are still too recent. Their hmm. origin is generally estimated. Jump! Jump! It's Marvin! J.G. Fergie. Oh, cousin Marvin Barry. Is it You know that new sound you looking for? Well, listen to this! Welcome, welcome. JG, how did your stream go? I hope it was really good. Welcome, welcome. How did the art making go? Teeny little red lol. Well, I'm grateful for it nonetheless. JG Fergie, thank you, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. And happy World Frog Day to you. I hope uh I hope you had a great stream. That sometime after 65 million uh, years ago, which is 5 million years after Beelzebufo was already terrorizing Madagascar. So there's a lot about this frog that science can't quite explain yet. We're not sure yet. where it came from and not sure yet. where it went. All of the fossils that we've found of it come from sites dated to the late Cretaceous. And there are no frogs closely related to it on Madagascar today. So mm. it's possible that Beelzebufo went extinct during the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. Pretty likely, I think. But we can't know for sure until we find more sites and more fossils that are more recent than that. Now, even though we don't have a lot of answers, this weird amphibian can still teach us a lot about the patterns of evolution. Like, if Beelzebufo and Pac-Man frogs aren't related and they just converged on the same adaptations, then that tells us that there's something about being big and mean and extra bumpy that gives a frog a selective advantage in a dry seasonal environment. And hmm. if they are actually related, then that tells us that there may be gaps in the fossil record of frogs that's used to set the molecular clock, and that frogs hmm. were probably much more widespread back then than we thought. But hey, if nothing else, you and I learned today that Pac-Man frogs are a thing. Oh, I already knew that. Pretty happy. Yeah. Cool stuff. Here is a link to this video right here from PBS Eons. There you go. And, uh... Let's take a look at this video right here, too, to kind of close out 
world frog die. Don't worry, I'm not actually gonna stop streaming. We're just gonna move to a different channel after this, but from the take a look. Chinese giant salamander that can reach nearly two meters to the deadly poison dart frogs of South America, brightly colored to warn you not to touch. Amphibians are found worldwide. Yeah. Amphibians includes frogs, salamanders, and the legless burrowing Sicilians. Yeah. It's such a diverse group. I mean, we have like over 8,000 different species of amphibians with different modes of reproduction from frogs that, where the males carry the eggs until they lay, uh, they, they, they drop the tadpoles in the water or male and female sharing um, um, duties and looking after the tadpoles, females laying eggs to feed unfertil unfertilized eggs to feed their tadpoles or other amphibians that lay thousands of eggs and they just hope for the best and never see their tadpoles. So you have this whole diversity, not just in terms of reproduction, but in terms of colors, in terms of sizes, frogs that are the size of a fingernail all the way to frogs that are like football. But across hmm. uh, the world, amphibians are in a crisis. Yep. Over 40% of amphibian species are experiencing population declines. They are the most threatened class of vertebrates, with at least 200 species having already gone extinct since the 1970s. Habitat destruction, climate change, pollution and poor management of fresh waters are just some of the major threats facing amphibians really today. Really no expense. And Salamander, Salamander thank you for gifting gift Snail Chaser. One sub to snail underscore chaser. They I do have given 58 that. gift subs in the channel. Thank you, thank you, Salamander. Thank you kindly. Yeah, frogs really need our help, and... We'll be talking about this, I think, some more at the end of April. Uh, Save the Frogs Day. It's April 28th every year. So I think we'll continue this video then. Because I have got to go raid into Cyant Streams and do my crossover with Balint. minutes, they were finding fossils. And t 12, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. You've arrived just in time. We are going to go say hello to Cyant Streams not say hello, I'm going to be on camera. We're going to be discussing scientist to scientist some different papers from each of our respective scientific fields. We're going to be talking about the evolution of ants and flowering plants. How they may have helped save each other from extinction. And then we're going to be talking about these lovely plants here called cycads and why they are not living fossils as they've often been termed. It's a new scientific paper that just came out, what, yesterday, the day before, something like that? That makes that argument. So if that sounds interesting to you, then don't go away. Stick around right here. We are going to wrap things up on this channel, and then I'm going to jump in with Balint and appear as a guest star on his channel. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh. There we go. Um, thank you to everybody who's contributed to making this stream a rip-roaring success. Thank you to everybody who followed on World Frog Day today. Everyone who subscribed or resubscribed or got gifted a sub. I think this also includes gift recipients. Thank you to those who gifted, those who cheered, those who asked questions, those who lurked, those who moderated, those who raided in. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you. And again, please come in along with the raid. Please join the raid so that... Uh, Oh, you're going to see a really, really cool discussion. I can't wait. Balint from Science Dreams. I'm going to be joining as a molecular and systems biologist. PhD from Dartmouth. He's a, you know, he talks about genes. Talks about ants. Talks about all kinds of cool stuff. 
And of course, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. We're going to have a fun crossover conversation that you're not going to want to miss. So join us for the raid. I'll be streaming again tomorrow extra early in the morning. So keep a lookout for that. Anyway, let's go jump into science streams. I'll see you there.